Thank you so much. First of all, um, thank you to everyone for coming and thank you to Sabina and Francesco for organizing the conference. I, it's been really interesting to hear about uh, housing informality in other contexts um, and I'm learning a lot and I see so many parallels between what's happening in California. So it's really great to sort of take a comparative perspective to some of these issues. Um, so my name is Steven Schmidt and I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Sociology at the University of California, Irvine. And the title of my talk today is Maintaining Inequality, How Tenant Screening Practices Shape Housing Informality and Apartment Maintenance in Los Angeles. So this is an excerpt from my dis ongoing dissertation research. So just a kind of a quick roadmap of where we're headed today. So first I'll discuss a little bit of the literature that I'm drawing on to theorize um, my case. Then I'll move into the main research questions and just introduce the field site a little bit to give you some more context about Los Angeles and what renting looks like in LA. Um, and then I'll move into the findings and then I'll wrap up with the conclusion and what it might mean for some future directions of research. So in terms of informality and um, housing, so kind of like Noel was talking about, we have informal housing production, uh, but I'm focusing more on informal housing arrangements. And so what I mean by an informal housing arrangement in this context is um, any sort of violation of a stated lease agreement in the rental market between a tenant and a landlord. So in Los Angeles, that includes things like doubling up uh, which refers to two adult households that live together, um, but maybe only one is on the lease, or something like exceeding an occupancy limit of an apartment, um, or holding a verbal lease agreement. And the reason why informal housing arrangements are, um, yeah, of interest, so there's a few different things. So the first is that they can be fairly precarious. So if you're in a you know situation where you're violating your lease in California, um, that is just cause for an eviction and a landlord can ask you to leave with only a couple of days notice. Um, and so I'm I'm kind of asking the question, how does how do informal housing arrangements in the rental market relate to housing conditions and experiences of unit maintenance? And so uh, the reason why I ask this is because we know that housing conditions are consequential for family well-being in a few different ways. So common um, problems with the rental housing stock in California, so including like the presence of pests, like bad um, non-work functioning appliances, lack of good heat or cooling, right? Um, those are consequential for things like chronic respiratory illness, um, uh, physical hazards in the home pose a danger to, you know, small children. Um, the number of people living in the house can impact things like sleep quality, stress, and anxiety. And so understanding uh, the determinants of housing quality is, is important for family well-being. Um, so in terms of what we know already, in terms of unit maintenance, um, there's some recent research that shows sort of how the transition um, from private owner not private ownership, but from individual ownership to an LLC or limited liability corporation in California is associated with um, decrease in housing quality. And that is because that's a legal kind of formation that allows the landlord to transfer uh, legal and financial culpability to, the, to a corporation instead of the individual. So we know that once buildings are transferred to an LLC, um, we see signs of increased city complaints around things like housing quality. Um, Chisholm and her colleagues have a really some, a body of really interesting work coming from um, New Zealand, I think, that looks at the power dynamic between tenants and landlords in terms of uh, if, if tenants feel comfortable articulating a problem with their apartment. And so that's sort of where I focus. And while they're kind of looking at um, identifying the presence of a power dynamic, I'm kind of interested in taking a step back from that and sort of looking at, okay, well, what is developing or exaggerating this power dynamic between tenants and landlords? Um, and what can kind of like mitigate that potentially? And so I draw on literature and informality as a condition that's produced by state intervention. Um, so I'm interested in how public policy around tenant screening practices in particular, how that how that generates power dynamics between tenants and landlords. 
All right. So um, in terms of the research questions that are guiding this project, so I asked, why do renters in LA uh, enter into informal housing arrangements? Kind of a, a basic question. And then compared to formal renters, how do informal housing arrangements relate then to unit maintenance and physical well-being? Okay, so in terms of the data, I, I this is part of a, my broader dissertation research, um, and I'm using a subset of interviews with uh, 38 low-income Latino first-generation immigrants in Los Angeles. So I interview people who live in one of three neighborhoods, um, the questions focus on families, housing, careers, so how they arrived at their apartment, um, where they're coming from, as well as their experiences with apartment maintenance. And I compare 20 families living in informal arrangements with 18 uh, families who live formally. And so just a, a, some quick context about Los Angeles, just to kind of introduce it a little bit. So. Los Angeles is a city in the U.S. state of California. Um, it sits on unceded Gabrielino and Tonga territory. It is historically an immigrant gateway city uh, for migrants from Central West Mexico and increasingly in the past few decades, Central America. Um, it's a majority renter city, so about 60% of LA households are renting. And the majority, or excuse me, about 50% of households are rent burden, meaning that they pay about 30% or more of their monthly income in rental costs. So um, just some more context. So let's imagine that you all are moving to Los Angeles tomorrow and you start looking at apartments. Um, you're gonna start going through a process of tenant screening uh, here in California. So what this looks like, uh, you'll be asked to provide a social security number, which is in the United States, our de facto national identification number it's given to citizens, permanent legal residents, and authorized temporary workers. Uh, landlord will use your social security number to conduct a credit check and a background check. Um, they'll charge you $50 per adult in order to run the credit and background check. Um, they will ask for up to three months of monthly rent as an entry fee. Um, so that includes the first month's rent and then two months rent as a security deposit. Uh, landlords in LA adopt a no blanks policy of rental applications. So if you fail to fill out any part of the application, uh, your application will be rejected. And landlords uh, use a, they establish an occupancy limit of two, two people per bedroom plus an additional person. So for a one bedroom apartment, that's a limit of three people, a two bedroom, um, five people, and, and so on. Okay, so just to summarize, kind of give you a broad overview of the findings of the study. So research question one asks, why do renters enter the informal housing market in Los Angeles? And what I find is that um, many informal tenants try out the formal market. Um, however, they're rejected because of having a very low income or no social security number. Um, and that their housing searches are long, demoralizing, and very expensive. So it's normal in the sample for people to be looking for housing for six to seven months. Um, they'll apply to sometimes five, six, seven units. And so if that is, you know, two people, uh, two adults applying, right, that's almost six, seven hundred dollars uh, just on housing applications alone. And these are families that earn, you know, maybe 25,000 US dollars yearly. So it's a, they're expensive. Um, so people really move to the informal market kind of as you would imagine to sort of bypass some of these strict screening requirements. And then in terms of the second research question, um, so this asks kind of what are people's experiences then with apartment maintenance? So what I find is that um, informal tenants sort of exist, and I'm categorizing these as different types of informality. Um, there's probably a better way to state this, but this is what I'm working with so far. Um, so on, on one hand, we have uh, renter families who exist in this sort of open informality. So they might be, um, maybe they've exceeded the occupancy limit on their lease, or they're renting a bedroom from another family, but the building manager, the owner is aware of it and it's tolerated. And on the other hand, we have um, families who have 
more concealed or hidden informality. So these are people who are also violating their lease, but um, they attempt to conceal that from the building owner. And I find that relative kind of compared to the formal tenants, the informal tenants, um, both open and concealed, they both experience, well, they both defer maintenance. So they are less likely to make like a request about a problem that's happening in their apartment. Um, when the openly informal families do ask for maintenance, it's often delayed, like on the order of months. And then the concealed informal renters report feeling a lot of stress, anxiety, and social isolation. So they tend to withdraw also from the social fabric of your building. Um, so the next few slides, I'm going to be presenting some vignettes of just people that kind of exemplify these positions. Okay, so the first uh, renter that I'm presenting, her name is, her pseudonym is Vanessa. Uh, she was not able, so she is, she's married. She herself is a U.S. citizen, but her, her husband is undocumented. Um, they also have a um, subprime credit score. So they spent several months looking for an apartment. They weren't able to find one um, because of her husband's legal status and credit history. And towards the end of the housing search, they just started kind of, they, they used to apply and um, submit applications and pay the fee. But towards the end, they started to just negotiate directly with building managers who just told them not to bother applying with their credit. Um, so after a long housing search, they eventually decided to move in with her mother-in-law um, who was living in a two bedroom apartment. Um, they do, so they're exceeding the occupancy limit and they're also not technically allowed to be renting the room um, per her in-laws um, lease agreement. So, and there are problems in this apartment, but Vanessa tells me that she doesn't feel comfortable saying anything about it to the building manager. So she is an openly informal um, because the building manager is aware of her, but she still sort of withdraws from making maintenance requests. So here's a, just a quote from her. She says, I'm not on the contract, so I don't want to say anything. I don't you know, want to cause any problems. He's never said anything to me before. He knows who I am. But because like I said, uh, I tried applying before and she or the manager's wife doesn't say anything. He always says hi, but I'm like, whatever. He doesn't bug me at all. So she kind of, um, she knows that they know that she's there, uh, but she still doesn't like to complain about uh, ongoing problems in the apartment uh, because of uh, she knows she's not on the contract. So that's one way in which this informal housing arrangement kind of relates to tenant uh, experiences of maintenance. And so the other, the other kind of form of open informality um, has to do with maintenance delays. And so what I find is that uh, even when families do, who live in these informal arrangements do feel comfortable requesting uh, maintenance and repairs, often they report um, large delays in receiving them. So, and again, this is relative to the formal tenants. And this usually happens when there are bigger problems in the apartment. So, um, you know, deferring the maintenance requests only goes so far. Sometimes these units have really severe habitability issues that have to be addressed. Um, so the next renter, I um, gave her the pseudonym of Martha, and she found her current two-bedroom apartment through her social network. Um, she is undocumented, so she doesn't hold a social security number. Um, in order to help with rental costs, she rents one of the other bedrooms to a single mother. So she's informally, she's exceeded the occupancy limit, and she's also um, doing a sublet, which isn't technically allowed on her lease. Um, so she reports a lot of maintenance and habitability issues in her unit, um, but she says that she had such a hard time even finding this place, she's reluctant to leave or to look for another apartment. And so just a quote from her, I asked her if there are any problems in her unit. She told me, oh yeah, the kitchen's pretty bad. The cabinets are broken. The fan doesn't work. The bathroom and kitchen floors are broken. The sink, the walls have small holes. They, they won't fix them. They say they're coming and then they don't. I had a problem a year ago with the leaking sink. Almost six months went by before they came to fix it. It smells so human, but they didn't do anything. And so um, we see that even though this renter is making requests for her apartment to be repaired, um, she's not receiving them. And she faces these challenges on the housing market. Uh, and you can see why it's, uh, this type of arrangement might lead to landlord disinvestment in these, in these units. Uh, 
Okay, and then the, the final vignette that I would like to highlight um, has to do with this more hidden informality and experiences of maintenance. And so Sandra is a, um, she's a, also undocumented renter. She lives in a one bedroom apartment with her children and her husband. Uh, she found the apartment through her social network. Uh, so a woman she knows who also lived in the building. However, the, her friend advised her to only report um, one child on the housing application and she has three. Um, so she exceeds the occupancy limit that's listed on her lease. Um, and so, but she doesn't think that the building manager is aware of it. However, this arrangement has like has led to a lot of um, reports of anxiety and stress and also social isolation. So here, I so I don't have a verbatim transcript from this respondent, but I'm just presenting um, instead an excerpt from the field notes that I do write after every interview. Um, so these are my words, not hers. And she says. Uh, or I say that she says that she doesn't let her kids go outside the apartment because she's afraid that they would be violating the lease and evicted. She talked about how this was a big sacrifice for her family, but she did it for her daughter so they could stay in the same school. They do not ask for repairs. They don't want people coming into the unit. The apartment is badly maintained by the landlord. It has old carpet that needs to be replaced, drafty windows, cockroaches, rats, and they've paid out of pocket for pest control and maintenance. So, that's another thing that's uh, a lot of these renter families are investing some of their own money uh, into the upkeep of their units, um, things that would normally fall under what we call the, in California, the warrant of habitability. So the agreement that a landlord makes to provide habitable housing for, for tenants. So let me just check the time. Okay. so. Um, in terms of the implications for renter health, so I, I find that compared to formal renters, the informal families are more likely to either defer maintenance requests um, or when they there's an issue that's really serious and they do request maintenance, they experience really long maintenance delays. Um, they do not report problems. It's difficult for them to leave these substandard units because of the tenant screening practices. Um, so there's they have greater exposure to things like mold, uh, pests, physical hazards. Um, and then the, the concealed informal renters really ex report experiencing a lot of stress and anxiety. And what is, what is you know, particularly um, consequential here is that they withdraw from the social fabric of the building. And so renters like Sandra, who are more hidden and informal, um, don't get to know their neighbors. They don't allow their children to play outside. And they really, and we know how important social support networks are for, for families managing the everyday kind of survival um, of poverty, especially in the United States where we have a very frayed uh, social safety net. Um, so it is, these renters are really kind of experiencing and reporting a lot of isolation. All right, so just to kind of summarize and conclude, um, I find that tenant screening practices in Los Angeles, including requiring a social security number, the high cost of entry to apartments, credit and background checks, those really push families to the informal market. Um, informal housing arrangements, as I've shown, help tenants bypass these types of entry requirements. Um, these informal housing kind of arrangements sort of influence tenant, how tenants uh, feel about requ requesting maintenance in their apartment. Um, I've also tried to draw attention to the heterogeneous forms of informality. So it matters if your building manager is tacitly aware of the fact that you are, you know, ex exceeding your occupancy limit. Um, and I've highlighted the role of building managers as sort of street level bureaucrats in, um, in, in producing these outcomes. So I think future research could really highlight kind of the role that building managers play, as well as sort of what are the screening requirements that these doubled up families still have to go through. So if you're renting a bedroom from another family, kind of what are the criteria that they are then applying uh, to you? So um, I think that could be some fruitful directions for, for housing informality and research. So, Thank you very much. That is the presentation.